Hello, my name is Adam Bushakiewicz and I'm an art historian and also a historian of Warwick Castle and its earls. I caught COVID this week, um, but rather, you know, sort of wallowing in my own sadness, I, I thought I would use this time more productively and, and record a lecture, an illustrated lecture, in fact, about a set of documents that I'm rather passionate about. Um, in fact, these are a set of watercolours and a memoir made by this young man, Henry Richard Greville, Lord Brooke and later third Earl of Warwick. Indeed, I've been spending probably the past 10 years of my life being rather obsessed with Henry's home, Warwick Castle. And indeed, uh, this is what that magnificent place looked like in the mid 18th century when the great Canaletto visited the Midlands and produced, in fact, no fewer than five painted views of, of Henry's home. And this is later on in the 18th century when Joseph Wright of Derby nonetheless visited Warwick and produced this more atmospheric and romanticized scene, not perhaps giving us a, a sort of a detailed, um, you know, depiction of what the castle looked like, but more about what it feels like to visit such a, a beautiful, romantic and, and rather, um, rather interesting place full of chivalric and romantic associations. And in the 19th century, none other than the great Turner came several times, in fact, to produce magnificent wall to colours of the castle. And this is indeed um, his later view produced in 1830, now a part of the Whitworth Art Gallery in Manchester. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, if you visit Warwick Castle today, then, uh, well, this is what it looks like. Um, since 1978, Warwick Castle has been owned by an entertainment company. In fact, the castle's last owner, David Greville, Lord Brooke, sold the castle and its remaining collection for 1.5 million pounds in 1978 to the Two Swords Group. And since the 1970s, really, um, due to the fact that, that Warwick is, is owned by what is now an absolutely enormous entertainments company, very few scholars, academics, art historians and historians have really ever spent time looking into the history of the place, but not only the history of the ancient building, but the many later earls and countesses who are great collectors of art and patrons in their own right. And over the past few years, I, I've spent an awful lot of time in the Warwick Castle archive for my doctoral research. And indeed, um, in 1978, not only was the castle sold, but in fact, the entire archive consisting around a thousand boxes. Fortunately though, David didn't sell it to the uh, entertainments company, but in fact to the Warwickshire County Record Office, who is now the custodian of this magnificent collection really of documents and, um, and, and well, well, treasures on paper, I suppose you'd call them, um, which span, as I mentioned, over a thousand boxes. And in the 1970s, there was of course a great enthusiasm for cataloging the collection, but as you might imagine, um, money quickly dries up. And that means that so many of the boxes have been left really cataloged at box level. And, and, and what I mean by that is, is that so many of the boxes there are, are described in the catalog of as, you know, 19th century correspondence, and that's it. Well, you know, as a, as a researcher, as I am, um, I'm of course a very nosy person and always wanted to know more. And in fact, there are, are, are several boxes which, are, which have long been known to contain enormous amounts of watercolours, drawings, and other artworks, which the family had amassed over centuries. And this is particularly the case of the 18th and 19th centuries. And so you will often come across um, boxes filled with figural studies like this one. You will often also find images um, almost like this of, of a, um, a classical interior, almost an architectural capricci, uh, but also um, particularly there are a beautiful set of, and, and, and when I say hundreds, there are quite literally hundreds of watercolours produced by the earls and, and sometimes um, the countesses whilst they were off on their grand tours. And um, the Grand Tour, which was effectively an institution where lots of British aristocrats would tour around Europe, well, did often, quite often produce these magnificent drawings and watercolours of all the places that the family had seen, but these had never really truly made sense because they were lacking context until a few years ago, in fact, where I found um, this, a memoir produced by Henry Richard Greville, Lord Brooke, uh, between the years 
1801 and 1803, when he was a young man in his early 20s traveling around Europe. And, and this, um, this book, in fact, has never before been catalogued properly. It, it has quite literally been rediscovered in one of these enormous boxes filled to the brim with materials. I should also, I think, say just a few, year, a few words about what the Grand Tour was. Of course, I know this, this cultural institution is probably very well known to you all, but the Grand Tour was really um, an opportunity for young, well, aristocrats, both men and women, I should say, to travel Europe. And, and so often this is compared to the modern or the contemporary gap year. I, I, I'm, I'm often very unconvinced by that, by that comparison. I think most people on their gap years and then their Euro travels, as I did when I was young, you know, most of, most of our modern gap years are just full of drinking and, you know, all of those, uh, um, you know, rather less cultural pursuits. Uh, but in the 18th century, it was about drinking, but it was also about so much more than that. It was also about, I think, having a first-hand experience of the culture and civilization of Western Europe. You could travel around Italy, visiting all of the great um, art galleries, also the great classical buildings, which would have such a profound effect on the on the buildings of this country when drawings and architectural books were brought back and um, well young aristocrats of course were building great stately homes in these in this palladian style as, as we all know here of course we have a view of the plaza de spania in in rome which was really the hub of any british grand tourist in the 18th century and um so many of these young men and women did go when they were rather young in their late teens or in our case Henry visited Europe when he was in his early 20s. And so often so many satirical prints of the period show us these young, impressionable um, men, you know, with their tutors behind them, carrying books, you know, all the things they should be doing. And of course, I think this young boy is about to be ripped off by some French innkeepers, it looks like. And of course, so much satire is also made about what these um, young men, women were like when they came back. Um, often in, in England, the, the nickname that they were given was um, macaronis. And indeed, this, of course, was a play on this, this new food that, that of course, um, these young Brits had encountered off on their travels in Italy and had returned to this country full of all of those new trappings, those new fashions, and um, not only in clothing, but in art and portraiture and all of that sort of thing, um, which is off, so often satirized. The Grand Tour really was this phenomenal um, education which allowed these these um, these these young tourists to 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 really um, understand and appreciate culture but also um, more interesting aspects of, of I think youth as we will soon hear but coming back to the subject um, of my lecture Henry Richard Greville was um, a boy of, of, of rather good upbringing of course he studied um, at the University of Edinburgh like his father was. Um, he had grown up at Warwick Castle, which was this very grand place full of a beautiful collection of art and fine grounds as well. And um, his title as, as a young man was Lord Brook, the title which all future earls of Warwick have, and he would later become the third Earl of Warwick. He was born in 1779, and his grand tour was, um, was undertaken between the years 1801 and 1803. Um, this is Henry as a, a young boy on the left here, you can see, painted by George Rumney. And indeed, um, I, I should point out to you that, that Henry had a, a phenomenal upbringing, particularly with, with I should say, artistic interest. Um, Henry's father, George Greville, the second Earl of Warwick, was a great patron of contemporary artists and also a collector of great old masters, I should say. Um, George was um, the first aristocratic patron of George Rumney, who produced this magnificent portrait of Henry with his with his mother and sister. But also George was a, a phenomenal patron of watercolor painters and artists. Indeed, um, he was trained uh, as a young man by none other than Alexander Cousins and also traveled in Europe, I should say, with the likes of John Warwick Smith on tours together. He would actually, in fact, travel around with artists producing watercolors of what he saw. And so the young Henry too, it's quite obvious and quite clear, had artistic training. And, and so many of these watercolors and, 
um, sketches today I'll show you uh, were in fact made by him and they're, and they're rather good. I think it's so easy to brush aside these, these um, aristocratic attempts at art as just, you know, amateurish scribbling. But in fact, when you see, you know, lovely drawings in, in, in pen and watercolor like this one of, of Rome, for example, with the Colosseum in the background, you really get a feeling that he, he's rather good at, at, at particularly landscape painting, I should say. And on his tour, of course, he wasn't alone. He took servants with him and at various times was accompanied by friends. And ind indeed, this is the only self-portrait of Henry which survives during his grand tour. Henry is on the left here. And on the right, he is joined by his friend, Lord Grantham, um, not to be confused with the Lord Grantham who's in Downton Abbey, I should say. And I, I absolutely love this, this little, um, this little self-portrait or a little caricature of themselves because it's quite obvious, I think, that Henry was not particularly good at drawing figures, <laughs> should be said. But also look at their costumes. This was made, in fact, when they were in Switzerland visiting a wedding party. And, and I love their costumes, you know, with those little orange cravats, their hats, their walking sticks. And by the way, this is another friend that joined them along the way, a dog called Fritzi, nonetheless, who they seem to have uh, befriended in, in Switzerland or in, in Austria or Germany at some point, and brought along with them. Henry's tour um, was, was made actually during a very opportune moment in European history. Um, in 1801, uh, of course, there was a, a brief peace, um, the so-called Peace of Luneville, which revolutionary France had signed with many of the great European powers, which stopped, of course, the web, uh, revolutionary wars which were spreading across Europe. Indeed, in the late 18th century, it was very difficult for British tourists to go and travel because of, well, of war. <laughs> you don't want to be caught out in the wrong place. And so in 1801, our tourist Henry had the supreme opportunity to, to travel and see as much as he could. And indeed, he traveled for over two years, which was a rather substantial amount of time. And I've plotted out here on this contemporary map of Europe exactly where he went. So he had a rather uh, amazing tour, which brought him to some fascinating places, starting off, of course, in England and then heading over through Denmark, through Sweden, through Russian Finland, into Russia itself, to Petersburg, Moscow, and then back to Petersburg, all the way down through um, modern day Latvia and Estonia, um, traveling through through Germany or Prussia, as it then was, down into in towards Austria, through Switzerland, um, and, and the most amazing thing is, is that, of course, he continued through Italy, which was which was really the high point of many grand tours of this period, but also went much further than that. He stopped at Naples and managed to get on a boat to travel all the way across to Greece, where he traveled to Athens and even on to Constantinople and then made it back just in time through the Balkans, really, to, um, well, to um, to get out of the way of Napoleon's oncoming armies. Fascinating. But I thought I'd start the trip with um, the first great stop that Henry made on his tour, which of course, as you can see, was none other than Denmark. He in fact um, set off from England on the 12th of June in 1801 and continued traveling all the way up until August in 1803. So it was a rather significant period that he was traveling. Um, in and he saw an awful lot too, which which I'm very envious of. So his first stop was in Copenhagen in the summer of 1801, and it's rather fascinating to know, of course, that um, that Henry was there just only a few months after this scene was happening in the city. Of course, as you probably know, uh, none other than the great uh, Nelson had bombarded the city to to stop the Danish fleet accidentally, um, well, accidentally joining revolutionary France. And it's so interesting from, um, from Henry's memoir, where he explains where, um, that in his own words, the English are much hated as the nature of the time and circumstances would warrant. The late bombardment of their fleet is never mentioned before strangers. The English here say Lord Nelson might have done what he chose with the town. The Danes hold a different language, which is a rather funny, I think, um, well, interpretation of, of events. And also there's a, a beautiful little quote um, that I'd love to read you. It seems that he was actually given some political papers along his tour, and this is what he wrote. Um, Henry wrote, I was indebted to my introduction to Count Oppenstein 
from a letter given me to him from Lord Nelson, who observed he had not many friends there just at present. Um, which is fascinating that, that he was given an introduction to this count by none other than Nelson himself. Um, and indeed, the Grevels did have a connection to Nelson. Um, the second Earl had had a correspondence with him, but also more amusingly, Henry's, um, well, Henry's great uncle, which we'll hear about later, uh, well, was none other than the great Sir William Hamilton, whose wife, Emma Hamilton, would later become Nelson's mistress. That's another story for another day. But anyway, there's a, a very fascinating connection with Nelson and the Grevels, um, which is probably a podcast, a lecture for a future time, I think. But anyway, he didn't stay long in, in, in Denmark, but um, due to the fact it wasn't very friendly there, but continued through Sweden, where he was remarking on the fact that there were some very beautiful people to, um, to, to look at. And particularly, he, he describes all the way through his journey, exactly the different sorts of cultures he was encountering, the different sorts of peoples, um, and also very much the landscape. Sweden, uh, in his words, had these wonderful boulders and rocks that he was so fascinated by, and um, eventually managed to head into Russian Finland and visited none other than the great St. Petersburg itself. Um, St. Petersburg, well, and it's very interesting to consider, St. Petersburg was a very new city when Henry arrived there on the 23rd of August in 1801. And this is what, he, what Henry wrote about it, that we reached St. Petersburg, every trouble at arriving there is forgot at the first entrance. It seems incredible that in the midst of a wild, savage, wretched country, scarce able to find existence for the most miserable population that is thinly, thinly scattered over it, that a capital should rise in the space of 90 years, which would dare to call itself the mag most magnificent and beautiful city in the world, not erected in rude arrogance or peculiar to the habits tats of the country, but mostly in the best tastes in which size and magnificence prevails. And indeed, um, St. Petersburg was obviously very, very impressive to Henry. Um, and he spent, well, two visits there, as, as I will explain. But one of the first places that Henry was taken to, in fact, was a rather um, curious place. Um, this building, in fact, St. Michael's Castle, also known as Mikhailovsky Zamak, which was just, in fact, completed um, for none other than the man you see on the right. This is Tsar Paul I. The Russians, of course, called him Bierny, Bierny, Pavel, Paul, 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 because um, only about a few months before Henry arrived in St. Petersburg, Paul Tsar Paul, of course, had been assassinated um, in a coup which was probably led by his son, um, the future Alexander I. And the most amazing thing that, that Henry describes is that he was actually given a tour through the castle um, and was shown the exact room where Tsar Paul was murdered. And um, it's rather amusing that, um, that Henry was taken around by the emperor's own physician, a Scot called Dr. Wiley. And um, he describes in great detail in the memoir exactly how the king was murdered. And it, it, it's rather, um, rather sad. He, he describes that he, Paul, was strangled at last by his own military sash, which they drew around his throat. We went over the whole stage where this tragedy was performed only a few months since. The great apoplexy story was mysteriously said to be correct. The assassins received everywhere as if nothing had happened. Um, I wonder how that must have made Henry feel to be, be you know, um, to be basically toured around a, a, a murder scene. Anyway, um, that's what, you know, that's what, that's what the, the, the Russians uh, obviously wanted to show this young British, British aristocrat. And indeed, um, he wrote that Dr. Wiley himself allowed and indeed gave me the whole story without hesitation or an attempt or wish to make it a mystery. Very curious indeed. And um, Henry had a magnificent time in Petersburg up until the fact that, of course, as the Tsar had just been murdered, a new Tsar had to be crowned in Moscow. And so in September um, of 1801, Henry eventually um, head along the route to Moscow itself. And he records, in fact, um, a very arduous and very long trip. It was rather difficult, it seems, because 
um, the Tsar was actually moving to Moscow at exactly the same time that Henry was, and so they were playing catch up all along the on the road between Petersburg and Moscow, and um, and so there are a few little drawings of of the peoples and and houses that he stayed in. Uh, they're rather amusing. Here we have a, a Russian peasant bartering for a crucifix, and as you can see, um, it seems the road to Moscow was filled full of all these wooden cabins, which Henry describes as being very dirty and very smelly indeed. But um, arriving at Moscow, which he did um, in, in late September in 1801, um, we read that Henry was incredibly struck by it. He wrote, on entering Moscow, the curious effects of the churches and spires is what rivets your attention and takes you by surprise. There are between 1,000 and 1,500 churches, many with bunches of cupolae, some like pineapple or pearls, other spirals, some twisted and fluted, and full of ornaments painted of every colour, green, white or red, all together in compartments with gold or silver and a cross on the top of most. And indeed, Henry actually produced several watercolours and drawings of, um, of Moscow and the Kremlin. Um, this is my favourite, which shows you, of course, St. Basil's Cathedral, done in such a quick and, uh, you know, a, a beautiful way, I think, which is very sort of, um, which is very fun and, and pretty in, in its own way. Here, of course, is a view of the Kremlin, which, which Henry made, and, and um, you're probably all wondering, why is it white? Why didn't he paint it red? And we must remember that the, um, the Kremlin, indeed, was whitewashed um, in this era, apart from a few of the towers. But um, what's even more interesting is, is that Henry Richard Greville, this young boy from Warwickshire, was invited, in fact, to the coronation of Alexander I. This, of course, is the great Tsar of Russia who would eventually defeat Napoleon, nonetheless. And um, he gives the most brilliant description of the coronation itself, which was on the 27th of September, 1801. In fact, um, he writes, we got tickets for a good seat in the Church of the Kremlin and were there by time at 10 o'clock. The emperor and empress attended um, uh, with the Empress Dowager and two grand duchesses, the emperor in boots and a plain uniform, the empress quite plainly dressed likewise. And it seems um, that our young Henry found uh, the empress or the future empress of Russia very, very beautiful indeed. He wrote, um, but I do not believe there was an Englishman present who did not think her, the empress, the handsomest woman they had ever seen. And further than that, it seems that um, our young boy from Warwickshire was even present at one of the great balls and, um, and feasts arranged by Alexander I on his coronation. And indeed, he describes about uh, dancing various polonaises and waltzes. And in fact, at one of the, the, um, one of the, the, the major feasts that he attended, um, had a rather funny story attached to it. He writes, tickets were bought and I drew one, but for what purpose I had never heard till I was informed from one of the emperor's attendants, it was for a seat in the supper room, which I had found, most had found their corresponding ticket at the back of a chair into which they had seated themselves. But Henry writes, but mine I could nowhere discover while wandering up and down with a ticket in my hand, none of the same number on a, on a seat from whence I could attack a supper. And he then writes, I was seized by a servant covered in plumes and carried before the emperor himself, who was seated at a table with only the empress and royal family, where he, the emperor, desired me to sit down and eat my supper, which I did much to the horror of our ambassadors and others who thought I had done so inadvertently. Um, so it seems that our um, very amusing young man from Warwickshire had found himself sitting and eating at the table of the Emperor of Russia himself, which is, I think, a rather amusing anecdote, isn't it? Um, and Russia, I think, was filled with all sorts of entertainments and, and exotic things that, that the young Henry admired a great deal. Um, he painted a great deal of, of the, the various uh, Russian nobility that he came across, but also the, the, the ordinary people he saw in the streets. Here we have a lovely Moscow merchant and his wife, but also, um, as you might imagine, as Russia is very much a, an intercontinental place, um, there, were, there were peoples from all the vast places 
of Russia. There were um, lots of Chinese, lots of Asiatic people, and also Egyptians, in fact, dancing uh, for the emperor, which Henry, in, in this case, painted himself, which, um, which he found marvelous. They enjoyed the illuminations of Moscow. Uh, they also were very thrilled at the fact that, that particularly everything English was prized and attained in Russia. And he was describing how um, lots of the, the, the most expensive cloth that the nobility wear is English cloth. Um, and indeed, he headed back eventually to Petersburg, where he spent a great deal of the winter there in all sorts of entertainments. They drove around on sleighs. They visited Kronstadt. They had all sorts of dangerous adventures. I mean, this is, you know, these are stories almost out of, out of the books of Pushkin, I should say. They're very amusing sometimes. And he even um, spent a great deal of time, you know, um, riding on ice hills and things like that when he got back to Petersburg. These were sort of um, great entertainments for, for Russians to, you know, sled on, on freezing slopes. And uh, indeed, Henry, uh, poor soul, actually fell off one of these and damaged his arm quite badly, he writes. Um, but these are, are some of his watercolours that he produced, which are which are great fun. And, and I think um, Russia, particularly, it sounds like he had a great time there. And he wrote particularly of the, the hospitality of the Russian nobility. Um, there was not one evening where they had to, to eat supper by themselves. They were entertained each evening at all of the great palaces of the nobility in St. Petersburg, which made a, a, an awfully great impression on him, I think. But they needed to move on. And on the 10th of January, no nonetheless, um, Henry and Lord Grantham actually left Russia to head to Germany and to Prussia in particular. And um, that might sound a bit crazy to us. Why would you leave Russia in the midst of winter? But of course, uh, winter is a very good time to travel um, because everything's frozen and you travel on sleds, quite simply. Um, when spring comes around, and particularly in Russia, everything gets very muddy and very messy, very difficult to travel in spring. So um, by February, they managed to make it eventually to Berlin, the, um, the seat, of course, so, or the capital of Prussia. And um, unfortunately, uh, he found Berlin rather boring. Um, there were some balls that he attended. He, he describes actually of dancing with the Queen of Prussia herself, but actually describes um, Frederick Wilhelm III as, as, as a very dull man, um, which I, I find, well, rather, rather amusing. So he continued on further down south towards Dresden. Dresden was a bit more interesting for Henry because um, he visited many of the great art collections that were kept there, including admiring um, many Raphaels and uh, even buying some, uh, some ceramics, it seems. Uh, and I, I find this particular caricature rather funny um, of an old gentleman going out to dinner in Dresden, as you can see here. And actually, Henry wrote a little, a little anecdote about this man that I once saw while at Dresden some old gentlemen clawing out to dinner at about one o'clock with their hats under their arms to save a powdered wig, which was dressed but once a week. It seemed a very dull place. Um, so I, I find it rather amusing how, um, yes, he's obviously a, a comedic um, caricaturist is our Henry. But anyway, Germany um, continued. He visited several castles along the way and, and was particularly struck by the likes of Königstein near Dresden. Um, particularly with the grandeur of the setting with the trees and the forests. And it's, it's very key, I think, that later Warwick Castle would have many great um, trees planted uh, alongside the castle to, again, give a, a setting of this place, which was, which was very much along the lines of, of what um, these nobility would see when they were traveling Europe. Um, he continued on to Prague, where he very much enjoyed the views from the castle there, and also ended up in none other than Vienna. Um, he describes the inn he stayed in in Vienna as a very wretched and dirty place, um, but eventually met the minister um, in Vienna, a Mr. Paget. And indeed, it seems that Henry did stay in lots of the ambassadorial um, houses and uh, houses connected, um, particularly with the friends of the ambassadors on his travels. So very much in the idea that British um, yeah, ambassadors would keep something of, a, of a, an open house for visiting tourists. And eventually Henry was presented to the emperor and the empress um, themselves. 
Um, and, and Henry writes, there was nothing going on at court, the carnival being over and the place very dull. And he writes that we amused ourselves in constructing a sailing boat under Pelham's directions, who we called the Admiral. Grantham was a most valuable sailor and the rest of us could claim little more natural skill than a tolerable waterman. Uh, and in fact, um, so on the River Danube, they actually constructed a little boat and sailed, they say, all the way to Pressburg, which is modern day Bratislava. And indeed, supposedly, um, uh, supposedly even the emperor um, went out one day to see them on their boat. They visited the famous Prat in Vienna. They watched fireworks given by the Esterhazy family, a very famous um, uh, Austro-Hungarian nobility. And um, eventually decided by summertime to actually head um, away from Vienna and eventually to Munich. They had missed the elector there, but then continued particularly on to Switzerland, where they stopped at various mountain lakes and, um, and by late June or, or early July eventually got to Switzerland. And it's very interesting that actually throughout Henry's tour, it's Switzerland that seems to have taken him um, the most, I would say. There, there are more descriptions about the landscapes and places they visited in Switzerland, even more than um, the places they visited in Italy, actually, which is rather surprising for us today. But, but as I'm sure many of you know, Switzerland and its majestic mountains and sublime setting really was, I, I think, um, was very, very impressive to, you know, somebody who had been brought up in Warwickshire, you know, Warwickshire, just a county of rolling hills, very boring place compared to the Swiss Alps. And so um, he, he gives vast accounts of the changing weather, the landscapes, the various mines that they visited too. He also comments on the fact of the wreckage that Napoleon's troops had left while in Switzerland. And um, he wrote, Switzerland has accepted Bonaparte's constitution how it will end, no one can say, but no stranger but wish them but success. Their romantic history, their country so wild and splendid, their heroism and devotion is so uncompromising that deserted as they are by the whole world, their spirit is unbroken. And um, particularly, I think these, these, um, these vast men and many drawings that they encountered of, of the Swiss landscape really, it really shows that it must made a very, you know, very great impression on them. They had awful sorts of bad luck too in Switzerland, I should say. Um, they fell, nearly fell down some glaciers. They actually um, had one of their guides fall into some sort of ice chasm as they were traveling across some glacier, which sounds really, really quite awful. And indeed, uh, Henry himself actually um, fell off the side of one of his um, carriages at this point. But I think one of the most funniest stories actually happens to be a fight that Henry and his friends were involved in, in some inn in the mountains, seemingly because um, uh, some sort of landlord was upset at the fact he was shortchanged. And, um, and Henry writes this, that an altercation took place. I heard an immense noise in the passage and going out discovered the landlord had flown at our friend, kicked him in the stomach and was kicking and trampling on him in the most violent rage. I rushed out at him when he turned on me, but I struck him right in the face as he attempted to collar me, and in a moment he, his nose gashed out such a torrent of blood as covered his shirt and sleeves and flew all over myself. Our party got together and so did his, and the inn was filled, we defending the entrance of our room against their attack. And very luckily, just in time, the local magistrate came and... Um, these young Brits only had to pay a few more crowns to, you know, to pay off the landlord, which uh, settled things. But, um, you know, that that sort of plucky nature of, of British tourists, you know, going and traveling and causing trouble and getting into fights, you know, that happened in, in um, obviously in 1802, just as much as it happens today, in fact. Anyway, um, and also there were more elegant and more interesting, interesting um, amusements to to attend to. Uh, Henry bought some Swiss watches and clocks, which he admired very much. He bathed in the Lake of Geneva, and also he found himself being invited to a wedding party um, near the Lake of Lucerne. And, and so this is a little drawing that Henry made, which I introduced to you before, showing Henry, his friend Lord Grantham, with the wedding party, the bride and the groom and the bridesmaids. Um, 
all drinking and being merry, uh, which looks rather fun, doesn't it? I, I wish I was there. And indeed, um, Henry also made some, some lovely drawings of the landscapes that he encountered, as I mentioned before. This is the famous um, Devil's Bridge. And Henry was there quite literally um, around the same time that none other than the wonderful Turner was there, producing watercolours such as this famous one in Tate Britain. So um, I, I find it amazing that, you know, uh, that, that you know Henry was was in the place in the time you know at the same time where all of these great other artists um, more famous ones I should say were producing these magnificent views so these watercolors really are at that exact same moment um, that, that such phenomenally famous artworks like this are being produced which I think is is is, is magnificent um, if only these Warwick Castle watercolors were, were more admired but eventually of course they would, by late summer, make it into Italy, um, the, the point where any grand tourist would hope to get to. And um, <clears throat> it's rather funny, he of course descends into northern Italy. He describes that um, one of the great joys about descending into northern Italy were the vineyards, as they would help themselves to grapes. And he wrote, we eat grapes all day and eat till we can eat no more. So. Um, those poor landowners, I wonder if they were rather upset with that, uh, with that group of Brits. Um, he visited first Milan, where he visited the cathedral, the towers, very impressed by Raphael's, but in particular visited none other than Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. And he writes, the well-known picture of Leonardo da Vinci painted in fresco of the Last Supper we saw in the interior of a church, or rather what had been, for the French had turned it into a barracks and the soldiers had amused themselves in firing balls at it. It was covered with dirt and dreadfully covered with musket shot. So obviously um, he was rather less than impressed with the, the condition. And, and, and again, easy to forget that uh, Napoleon had of course sacked um, Italy at that, by that point and, and had left only just a few months before. So that's very much uh, a contemporary context. He head to Mantua next. Um, where he was rather disappointed by Mantua, apart from the paintings there by Giulio Romano. He headed to Verona, where he admired the, um, the great buildings by Palladio and paintings by Veronese. He visited Padua, which he described as a, a much wretched place. Um, but eventually, of course, he got to Venice, <clears throat> where he describes about um, uh, heading across the, the whole city by gondolas. And indeed, this is a watercolour of a gondola he must have travelled on. Um, was rather impressed with St. Mark's, climbed the Campanile, as, as every tourist should, and describes about all of the various boatmen and guides, these chicharoni who show you from one palace to another. Um, and uh, indeed, um, it seems particularly that by the time he left, um, well, Venice, he headed over to Bologna and Florence in particular. And one of the things that he writes about Bologna and Florence is, is how disappointed he was by these two cities. Why? Well, it's quite obvious that he had expected these cities to be filled with their great picture collections. But again, in 1802, um, all of these had been taken off to France, to the Louvre in Paris. Napoleon, as I'm sure many of you know, had taken away many of the great masterpieces of the Italian collections and had um, sent them off to Paris at this point. So it's rather, again, amazing um, considering the disappointment he describes. Um, he wrote, in fact, of the Pitti Palace that the splendid collection of pictures all sent off, nothing but bare walls left, some to Paris and the rest to Palermo. The French took 60 of the best. This splendid gallery is gutted, in his own words. But Fortunately for Henry, he had a much greater time in Rome, where he was staying on the Piazza de Spagna um, and had met Mr. Moore there, who was uh, his guide for Rome. And they arrived in Rome by the 10th of October. So they spent seemingly quite a, quite a few months or so traveling through these various Italian cities. Um, Rome, uh, of course, as you might imagine, was full of all of those great classical um, pieces of architecture which Henry had, uh, had of course come to expect and so there are lovely drawings and watercolours of 
the various ruins that one might encounter, including, of course, the Colosseum. This is a, a view of the interior of the Colosseum. And as you can see, it has a great big cross erected right in the middle of it because um, the Vatican had, of course, transformed the Colosseum into a church dedicated to the Christian martyrs. Um, he, he wrote very, very beautiful things about St. Peter's, um, about the marbles, mosaics and pictures, nothing can describe. And it, it, it's also uh, described that I was quite sick of sightseeing. A book will describe all I saw better than I can. Um, and so rather amusingly, his descriptions of these places are sometimes quite short. Uh, one of the, um, I suppose, quite amusing things is he, he often, you know, makes these little sketches of, of bits of, well, of, of various um, events that he, he witnessed, in this case, a funeral at Rome, which is, which is quite strange looking, as you can see, with, uh, with these caped figures. And particularly, I think the archive is full of these beautiful watercolours of, of, um, of many of the ruins that he encountered. Uh, which I, I think are, are done in such an artistically way. These these folios albums are, are quite you know quite literally sitting there unadmired, and I do hope there's a there's a, an effort in the near future to find some money to have them catalogued and digitized in full. That would be great fun. And eventually, of course, um, by the winter time, <clears throat> they had arrived at Naples. This is, of course, uh, a watercolor there of the Bay of Naples made from um, a particular palace, I should say, uh, formerly owned by Henry's great uncle, Sir William Hamilton, who used to be the envoy extraordinaire to the court of Naples, um, a name which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. <clears throat> Naples, I think, was a place of great excitement. Um, they had, of course, uh, spent a lot of time in places like Rome buying paintings, including his friend, Lord Grantham, who bought uh, paintings, I should say, in Rome by Salvatore Rosa, shells, rosaries, all sorts of curious knickknacks. <clears throat> but in Naples, it seems that they had a, a, great, a great time. There were many foreigners in Naples at the time, including lots of Russians, he describes. Uh, he describes actually being hosted a lot by the Countess um, Sakharovsky, I think that's how you pronounce it. And um, particularly, I, I think, because of his associations and his family connections with um, to William Hamilton, um, basically this opened up the court to him. Uh, there's some wonderful descriptions of, of Henry visiting Pompeii and Herculaneum, which is only nearby. He actually went off hunting with the King of Naples, um, who was delighting him supposedly with stories of Sir William. Um, they caught wild boar and he describes these, these feasts and, and dining with the King on wild boar liver soup and plates of macaroni. So, you know, he obviously had a a great time there. But eventually it was time to leave and um, it seems that it was in Naples that a plan started to be hatched between um, another Englishman or two Englishmen that, that Henry had met in Naples and that was on the left Sir William Drummond and in the middle George Hamilton Gordon, the fourth Earl of Aberdeen. And it seems Henry was in Naples at a, a particularly good time because a few of his other friends on his tour, were actually leaving Naples, heading back to England at this point. But it seems that um, our Warwickshire man wasn't so keen on doing that. So he heard the fact that Sir William, in fact, was just had just quite literally been appointed as the as the envoy to the court of the Ottoman Empire. And Sir William, it seems, had offered Henry and Lord Grantham a place on his boat so that they could sail all the way, of course, to um, Constantinople, the uh, or modern-day Istanbul, of course, which is the the capital of the Ottoman Empire, and it seems that um, that Henry definitely uh, wanted the adventure, and so decided to go along with him. Um, they were also, of course, joined by George Hamilton Gordon, fourth Earl of Aberdeen, who also was one of the party. And I should say, um, the Earl of Aberdeen later became Prime Minister in the early nineteenth century, which is also quite uh, amusing to consider. And the boat that they left on was captained by this man on the far right. This is Sir John Gore. The boat that would take them all the way to Constantinople was the Medusa. And Sir John Gore had actually had some interesting um, uh, naval battles uh, with the French just in the period before this. So he's, he's you know, he's a war-hardened captain. And I think one of the most funniest stories was the fact that Sir John Gore 
we hear in Henry's memoir was actually in the Mediterranean known as El Capitano Magnifico because he was supposedly the captain who gave the, the greatest and best parties on board his boats. So, um, so you know, that journey from Naples to Constantinople obviously was, um, was one of great fun indeed. And, and just before they actually left Naples, great parties were put on for this, uh, for this group of, of young Englishmen. Um, and he describes some, some really quite so really quite wonderful scenes where illuminations and all sorts of all sorts of um, some fun uh, activities were, were put on fireworks. They actually had had once rowed out into the boat into the bay of Naples itself and got lost in night <laughs> once, which doesn't sound so much fun, I suppose. But they had a really rip roaring good time before they left. And and just a little note, he also writes that um, just before they were leaving. He wrote, Lord and Lady Elgin arrived in the bay just in time from Constantinople and were of our party. And this, of course, is key because um, it, this is the same Lord Elgin who would, in fact, save um, or plunder, some would say, the, the Elgin marbles, those famous marbles in Greece, which we'll come back to later. So they set off on a boat, Lord Aberdeen um, and Mr. Gordon and also Lord Grantham on the 15th of March where they would head finally to Greece and finally to Constantinople. Um, they had a great time. They went to Sicily, where they saw Mount Etna. They um, also had, uh, I should say, this is a map showing you where they traveled. So along the coast of Sicily, they also stopped in Malta, where this lovely drawing was made. And they enjoyed their time in Malta because it, he wrote, in Malta, the English are worshiped. All the peasants anxious to hold your horse or do any act of attention or kindness. And of course, Malta being that great bastion against the against the French. And here we see that that um, that British Union Jack flown so proudly there from one of the forts. And eventually they came across the um, well Crete on their travels and then. Um, well, through to Athens itself. And there's a magnificent set of watercolors made of the approach to Athens, which I, I find so beautiful. Athens, as I'm sure you know today, is a, is a very, very dusty, very concretey place. But here we see that distant view of, of course, the Parthenon itself, that proud, that proud um, classical ancient Greek building, which was so admired into the 19th century. And, and, and Henry here was one of the first visitors of his generation to be able to go off and visit Greece. As you know, the, the 19th century was very much a period where, um, where Greece as a place for the Grand Tour was being opened up. In the 18th century, it was still very little visited, I should say. And his drawings of what he saw there were um, are very beautiful, as you can see with his little annotations here. And almost immediately when he arrives in Athens in April in 1803, he wrote, we were anxious to get out and justify our curiosity. The streets were narrow and bad, which led us to the object of our curiosity by the Acropolis in the center, which is the Parthenon or Temple of Minerva. The front is perfect and describe it would occupy a volume. Its immense size and beauty, um, beautiful simplicity though, and the base reliefs are of the most exquisite workmanship must be seen to be appreciated. Um, it is the most chaste Doric and of the finest marble, white as sugar when broke, but by exposure to the air takes a fine yellow tinge. And he writes actually, um, most interestingly, that the Turks pay no respect to these works of art and talk of taking down the Parthenon to build a citadel. Boys and beggars throw stones to break the figures, to sell horses and figures and fragments to strangers. Much as I admire them where they are, Sincerely now do I wish they were saved from these masters. I trust that the plan now employed by Lord Elgin may save them. So again, so fascinating that, that Henry is here in this exact period where the likes of Lord Elgin are starting to ask the question of what should be done with these classical works of art. And the rest, of course, is, is history. And one of the curious details, again, which I find rather amusing, is, is that Henry writes, <clears throat> I cut Aberdeen's name and my own on one of the pillars of the Parthenon and brought away a piece of the marble from the ruins, not for a recollection, for I can never forget it, 
but as a relic of the finest work I ever saw or ever shall see again, go where I may, which is wonderful poetic, isn't it? <clears throat> they made a great deal of visitors um, <clears throat> and visits in their time in, in Athens um, and in, around in Greece. This, this of course, ended in, in many beautiful uh, watercolours, including this, the Temple of, of Theseus in Athens itself. And it seems that, um, that particularly in Athens, uh, these young British aristocrats caught the eye of the daughters of the consul, the council, in fact, the, the man whose house these British aristocrats were staying in. And it's rather amusing how he describes that, that these daughters, we read, they never go out and amuse themselves, dressing and painting their eyelids. We dance their dances as well as we could, then in return tried a country dance. Even Mr. Drummond, myself and Aberdeen danced a minuet till we burst out in laughter and could not end it. So um, <clears throat> it seems that these British aristocrats were trying to teach the local, um, the local girls <laughs> uh, minuets and, and the such. He even describes the fact that uh, one evening um, the consul's daughters there actually stole two bottles of wine um, uh, from the British aristocrats and had each swallowed a good draught. And he writes, we dispatched for the ship surgeon who soon put them to their rights. These poor girls had stolen wine, not known what it was, drunk it and got blind drunk, which is amusing. And <clears throat> um, he also describes uh, particularly about, um, again, all, all of the interesting, amusing things that happened to him while he was there, but they continued eventually on their journey on their way to Constantinople. And um, the, the, the countryside, again, which he describes on his journey, I think he treats with such a, such a reverence because this is the classic, the, the hallowed ground, which he has learned about in so much Greek and, and ancient mythology. And um, it, it's rather touching, I think, that here we have indeed a watercolor completed by Henry of the Dardanelles. Again, this, this area of, of, of country, which would come up to Constantinople itself. Um, and unfortunately, on a, uh, it was at this point, in fact, that, um, that Henry lost his dog Fritzy, we're told. They had actually, at some point, um, stopped on the coast of the Dardanelles and gotten out and gone to explore some caves or something. And one of the ships accidentally fired a cannon and Fritzy, the dog, got so scared that he ran off into the, uh, yeah, into the, <clears throat> into the nature and they couldn't find him again. Poor dog. But of course, it was Constantinople, modern Istanbul, which really did capture the imagination and excitement of Henry. And he again describes the gardens, the, the houses of the aristocracy with such a, such a, a brilliance. He, he writes about, in the valleys are the most picturesque villages and everything looks brilliant. The rich woods, hills, palaces, summer houses, burial grounds in which Turkey are beautiful and the greenest verdure, the clearest water, the finest sky without a cloud are all united. I have seen it nowhere else. He describes about going to see um, St. Sophia, that very famous ancient church in Istanbul or Constantinople. He visits markets, he buys shawls and other such items in the bazaars there for him to wear. He even bought himself a small richly carved and gilt boat, which he sent back to England. I wonder what happened to that. Um, but most of all, um, he visits some very interesting, interesting places, um, particularly is, is, is set up, I think, by, by somebody um, um, or, or some member of the Turkish aristocracy. He draws scenes of, of, of Turkish noblemen um, smoking their pipes and enjoying their teas out in the, the countryside, as you can see here. Um, but really the most, possibly the most interesting account that he gives is about his friend, Mr. Drummond's um, initiation as the consul or, or the, um, the ambassador to the Ottoman Empire. And in fact, um, this event is rather amusing because he even draws, in fact, the Grand Vizier and Sultan Selim III. And he describes this with, with a, rather, a rather funny way. On the 17th of July, they visit the Grand Vizier and on the 21st of July, they actually had a state audience 
with the Sultan, and, and this is what he writes, that the Sultan was surrounded by Janissaries, guards, all dressed in the most esteemed and splendid costumes. Our horses were covered with trappings and studded with precious stones, but Henry's friend, poor Mr. Drummond, in a dress coat, blue silk stockings and black silk breeches, with a little black chapeau trimmed with feathers, which he could not put on his head, mounted on a black Arab charger. And indeed, um, it, it's rather amusing that he even describes the grand feast and meals uh, they, were, uh, they were given in front of them. And he describes um, dish after dish was served in succession, consisting of various sorts of hashes. We did not know how to attack them without knives or forks, but followed the example of the Turks who took two large fingers full and crammed into their mouths. We found we could continue to get something in but not very easily. Um, so again, he had to eat with his fingers. Anyway, also in Constantinople, he visits the very famous slave market there. And um, it seems that he was allowed to enter the place because he was with an officer of the Grand Vizier. And it seems that he describes the, the slaves there with a great deal of sadness. Um, it seems that he was expecting, probably because of paintings of the pier, to this to be a very exotic and beautiful place. But um, describes that they, the slaves, looked rather melancholy, and as any Turk can buy them, this situation must be one of apprehension and dread. So rather than coming away from the slave market with a feeling of, of beauty, he comes away with it feeling rather sad indeed. But the tour had to be stopped short, and it's possible, or quite possible, that Henry, if given the time and opportunity, might have even made it all the way to the Holy Land, who knows? Um, and indeed, uh, already by July of that period, there were rumours, it seems, Henry describes, about the oncoming war um, with France being reignited, so decides to travel back as quickly as he could. And one of the interesting things is, is that they decided not to go via ship past France, which would be quite a dangerous place to go, but actually took a route through the Black Sea and into um, the Balkans into Bulgaria and through Romania. And, um, and it, it, it seems rather funny as well that um, just before they were leaving, um, well, Constantinople, um, one of his friends, Lord Aberdeen, was actually offered the, um, the daughter of, of a local nobleman. He, he describes this, this leaving ceremony as being quite awkward because Lord Aberdeen was offered the daughter um, of, a, of, a, of an Ottoman uh, nobleman and was offered in exchange for the daughter an ancient Egyptian marble, which he declined. Um, rather funny, so a funny thing to imagine. But anyway, um, on their travel home, they went. And it was in Bulgaria, particularly, that they came across some very, um, some very precarious situations, particularly the Balkans, he describes, was full of banditti, these bandits who were, were particularly, um, well, were particularly harassing um, wealthy grand tourists like Henry. Um, he describes actually, um, meeting some some people along the way who were who were basically um, very very dodgy sorts and managed to acquire some guns for their own protection indeed this is what he did and indeed um, it was traveling through Bulgaria that bandits um, stole some horses from their party and he actually describes one of the 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 fights that they got into he wrote I had my saber over the shoulder and two brave loaded pistols one in each pocket we knew we had nothing else for it, not being within two hours march to any village uh, and the surrounding woods. So he was quite literally traveling through the Balkans um, in great, great danger indeed. And, uh, and here we have a beautiful drawing of some sort of, I think, Turkish um, guard who might have been sent with them to protect them along their route through Romania and back up to um, Germany where they could catch a boat. He heads through, um, in fact, even to Bucharest in modern day Romania and, and spends several days there. And it, it's quite interesting that in his, in his memoir, he describes about meeting a very interesting uh, Prince of Moldavia there. And, and it's quite obvious that, that Henry had actually met this chap, Alexander Morusius, I think that's how you pronounce it, who was a very forward looking um, sort of enlightened prince at the time, and he describes about how the fact that um, 
this prince of of, uh, of Moldavia was was one who really knew how to throw a party. We wrote, um, where well, we read, the dinner not very good, but the music was far from bad. They struck up God Save the King, which we were very pleased with when we considered the state of Europe at the time, and we were the nation to be devoted to Bonaparte's vengeance. Um, so again, that feeling of, 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 of the oncoming war was certainly on his mind. He also describes that when they were in Bucharest, um, they had uh, men carrying feathers um, next to them who basically used these peacock feathers to stop flies from landing on them at dinner. So that, that's very interesting. So they carried on through North, through Poland, through nearby Krakow, I should say. He visited the salt mines there. Um, he was in fact let down shafts by pulleys to, to visit these famous places. Uh, and in fact, um, one of the interesting things is he met a, an Austrian official who told him that England was to be soared to distinction and be divided, invaded. Bonaparte was marching again to subjugate Europe but we were to be the first to be sacrificed. I should never let him, and if I did, English was to be punished, and England was to be punished, and London burnt. He shook me cordially by the hand and wished me every success, but feared our doom." Um, so again, you might imagine that this last month of their travels was really um, as, as quick as they could really to get back, um, to get back to, to, to Blighty, and this they did by a route taking through northern Germany and then eventually um, after catching a boat they reached England safely on the 22nd of August in 1803. Um, and it's so interesting that, that Henry signs off this memoir in, in such a very touching way. He, he, um, he, he writes that we got into a chase and arrived in town safe in England where my legs did not keep me long and traveling in England after my first first tour from it did not surprise me less than anything I had met with during my travels. And when the landlords appeared with their bills of fare and asked me if I should choose beef, chops, steaks, fowls or duck, I answered, oh, and any you like. They are all new to me and equally acceptable. And I love that little end because it's obvious that um, the one thing he must have missed on his entire journey, of course, was English food, as we might imagine. And when Henry <clears throat> got back to, to Warwick Castle, um, I'm sure this, this, this grand tour of his must have made an absolutely enormous impression. And you, you might imagine that grand tours like this did. Of course, he continued painting throughout his whole life. And this is one of the views of his, of his ancient ancestral home that he created. Um, again, part of this selection of watercolours, which which I do hope will one day be digitized and archived and catalogued properly, um, and even perhaps put on display. But, but Warwick Castle really was to benefit from his connoisseurship of these travels. Henry continued very much to add to the collection of fine paintings and furniture, um, which he inherited and added to with great vigor. Indeed, Henry went back on a grand tour in the later 1820s, where he bought some very, very marvelous pieces of furniture, including um, beautiful Pietra Dura tables, which unfortunately were sold by the present owners of Warwick Castle in 2015. Um, and eventually Henry died in 1583, but ladies and gentlemen, and if you've made it all the way to the end of this, um, this illustrated lecture, I salute you. Um, but most of all, it seems that, that during my research into all of these boxes and watercolors, I found something else a watercolour, or drawing I should say, made by Henry's brother, Charles John Greville. Um, and indeed this drawing, believe it or not, was made in none other than modern day Saudi Arabia. What is the story about this little booklet? Well, that will have to wait for another time. I do hope you've enjoyed um, listening. Thank you very much for making it all this way. And I do hope that's brought to life this fascinating story of this of this um, young 20 odd year old um, British aristocrat. And um, well, I hope to speak to you again and hear you again, <laughs> speak to you again sometime soon. Farewell.